We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everybody to the early morning uh, here in Poland uh, session, Digital Sovereignty for uh, Open Source for Digital Sovereignty. Um, I'm very happy to uh, see quite some people online, very happy to have uh, two people who actually came from the United States to, uh, to participate in this conference. And also special thank you to our panelists, especially those who woke up in the middle of the night uh, being in the US. I appreciate uh, the effort and the commitment. Um, so I hope you grabbed a cup of coffee or you know whatever keeps you going. Um, I am Paula Grzegorzewska and I am a strategic partnerships director at Open Forum Europe, which is a Brussels-based think tank. And we mostly work on the intersection of technology and digital policy. Um, a big field of our work is open source and standardization, but we basically do anything that is open and digital. So I'm actually Polish, and uh, but have been living in Brussels for some time now. And it's really great to see the international community gather here and you know that we are still able to do it. Um, but yeah, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, I have Peter Sion with me, who is a policy manager at GitHub and who is a reporter and online moderator for this session. And he will make sure that we will share the results of it and you know that uh, we take care of our online participants because we know it's not that easy to be here. But uh, let's uh, meet our panelists. So I will start with, uh, with the online ones. Uh, so say hello to Mike Linksfire, who is a head of developer policy at GitHub. Hi, Mike. Um, he's a lifelong open source developer himself, and he leads GitHub's public policy work globally. Um, the second speaker is Jeremy Liang, and he's a deputy yep. secretary of the China Open Source Promotion Union. He's a professional open source developer and leader in China's permanent organization dedicated to open source software. Uh, nice to see you here. Uh, do we have Abhishek? Uh, hi. Um, so we have also Abhishek Singh, who's a head of e-governance division at the government of India. Among other things, he's responsible for overseeing the Digital India program, which brings e-services to India's over 1.4 billion citizens. We also have Lawrence Moroni, uh, who is the lead artificial intelligence advocate at Google. He leads developer relations for Google's leading open source platform for AI, which is called TensorFlow. I guess many of you know it. Um, and of course, last but not least, we have Natalia Langbird Wright, who is a PhD researcher at the Harvard Business School. And her recent paper on open source software and global entrepreneurship estimates open source's benefits to national startup ecosystems. But she will talk about it a bit more later. So. Before we start the actual session, um, I would like to provide small, small remarks on what we are talking about. Because I know that everybody talks about digital sovereignty, nobody knows what it is, or everybody defines it very differently. And I'm not really planning to define it here, but focus more on why we are talking about it and why this is so high on the political agenda. Um, so for me, what is very important here is the dependence. And the dependence seems to be the reason why so many policymakers, but also companies, also users, are talking about digital sovereignty. Because especially during the pandemic, suddenly our lives just switched online and just switched to digital. And I guess for many of us in this room or online, it's pretty straightforward. Like I took my computer home and that was it. Maybe added a screen or like bought a new chair. But for many people, it was a big change. And for many organizations, it was very difficult. So either it was the software layer, they had to organize in some way and they had to use services that you know, had to work for them, concretely for them and not for everybody. And this is something that open source brings, but I'm going to talk about it a bit more uh, very soon. Um, but this dependence is something that the governments, especially in Europe, try to fight with. Uh, and they're f searching for a way to have a less single vendor approach to getting their software services. Um, and here comes open source. I guess most of you know what open source is, but 
uh, quickly for those who you know maybe don't work on this every day like uh, like we do. So open source software is software that can be run and modified by anyone. So anyone in the world can check it out, can modify it to their own needs, and then can share the modified version. And of course, we have a plethora of different licenses that can be used you know, to ensure that this is working well. Um, but this is not the main topic of this session. So the point is that open source is a product of globally distributed developer communities who collaborate together, and they build and maintain whatever software, whatever services they're providing. And individual open source contributors benefit from the participation and they learn skills that can help them land jobs and build companies and further the innovation cycle. And when I was speaking about the innovation cycle, I mean, uh, Natalia is going to talk about it uh, in a bit different way than I am, but we conducted a study. Um, yeah, if you can uh, switch to the next slide. Um, we conducted, uh, conducted a study on the economic impact of open source. And it's a study for the European Commission that uh, Open Forum Europe, uh, so basically I and a couple of my colleagues uh, conducted. And the idea was that we wanted to see if there is actual economic benefit to open source. It's pretty difficult to grasp for many policymakers. And the last study of a similar type has been conducted in 2006. So of course, a lot changed in these 15 years. So what we found out in this study was that open source contributes between 65 to 95 billion euros yearly to the European Union's GDP. And this is huge, this is a huge number. And if we increased it, we would not only get the benefits from open source, but we will also just you know, see a very clear, simple economical results. So if you're interested uh, in the study, uh, here is a QR code that you, that you see. Uh, there is an executive summary for those who prefer the too long didn't read version because it's almost 400 pages long. Uh, we've met many nice uh, researchers on the way, uh, including Natalia, for example. Um, so, you know, I'm, again, I'm not going to define uh, digital sovereignty. If anybody is willing, feel free, you know, to do it in the chat or here in the audience. Um, but competition, interoperability, and choice is what I see as something that can lead us to a more digitally sovereign nations, regions, organizations, companies. But for this, we also need skills. So people have to be able to use those things and to use and modify whatever software they use. They use, And this is something that I would like to keep in mind throughout this session because they're the, you know, the two parts of the, of the theme of, uh, of this year's IGF. So one is economic and social inclusion and human rights. And the other one is universal access and meaningful connectivity. And on first sight, it might not seem that you know, this is so, our session is so close to this, but I do believe that it's very close. Uh, because you will hear how global community benefits from open source solutions and how collabor it collabor collaborates together and what tools are being developed. And, you know, they don't have to be developed hundreds and hundreds of times. Very often they are done maybe a dozen times or maybe just a couple of times. Or maybe you have a big, big global community that, you know, works for a common goal. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to uh, talk much longer about this because we have a great panelist uh, in this session and actually I am the only European here, so it's a, it's a very exciting debate for me because usually we, we do talk in a more European circle. Um, so yeah, we will start with introductory remarks. Uh, we will hear them from each of the speakers. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat or just keep them for the Q&A session, uh, Q&A part of this session. Uh, so we will start with, uh, start with uh, Mike Linksweyer. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. And continuing on the theme of your remarks, I want to draw out some things about digital sovereignty and open source and kind of lessons they have for each other. So I, I think of, without really trying to define digital sovereignty, key aspects of it are really about national national autonomy and security so that nations can protect themselves and their citizens, but also economic strength and key, especially in key technological sec uh, sectors, because without that strength, the capability to actually have autonomy uh, trails off. And open source, of course, is code that anybody can use and improve, and it's kind of a global team sport, not nationally focused at all historically. So what do these two things have to do with each other? And you can go to the uh, next slide. So 
we have open, uh, that's the symbol for open source or a symbol for open source if you're not familiar and kind of an open keyhole and a castle to symbolize sovereignty. So what do they have to do with each other? Well, one way to think about it is, well, open source is digital in a way. There are many millions of lines of code written over decades by open source developers between you and me. Um, you know, the, in the video capture on your device, uh, running the internet between us, and that all has to be maintained for everything to work. And uh, in, in that's true in, in every nation and across nations. I want to say that each is each digital sovereignty and open source are about autonomy and capability. And Paula already touched a little bit on that. The autonomy is kind of you don't want to be locked in. But something that I think is not focused on enough is what Paula touched on around skills, which is really capability um, to be able to use software to be able to use open source, you need the capability to be able to do so both within an organization and at the national level. So both digital sovereignty and open source have risks and hurdles. And I think they can actually be mutually reinforcing. And risk of at least naively pursued digital sovereignty includes kind of falling behind, becoming a technological backwater and kind of getting in a self-defeating mode where you don't want to exchange technological ideas with the rest of the world. You want all production to be local and that just doesn't scale. You're not going to keep, you're not going to keep up. I, I think from a global perspective, another risk of digital sovereignty is kind of basically cutting off the connections and scientific and community interchange that happens in the global technological community in a very like accelerated fashion under under open source. And that just has risks of treating technology as an adversarial thing rather than something we can all we can all benefit from and you know at a geopolitical level encourages things like technical technological surprise. So Open source also has a risk and probably the biggest risk is underinvestment. It can be thought of as a commons and, uh, and it's running the internet and our society effectively. So it does have the risk of, of underinvestment and sort of the, both the corporate or organizational journey and I think the national journey around open source and digital sovereignty can help, can help uh, fix that problem. So I want to illustrate some of this with the next slide and talk about the journey that companies in particular have been on over the last 20 years and try to make an analogy with the journey that nations are on really just as long, but I think, uh, I, I, I think um, happening slower simply because they're far, far larger and have more stakeholders than an individual organization does. And these, this is a, the asterisk is there is because this is really kind of a stylized description. There are many ways to talk about kind of the open source journey that companies and other organizations are on. Um, you can, you can search the web for open source maturity model to see very many different thoughts on this. However, these are some common and these stages kind of often happen at the same time and are overlapping and continue from one stage to the next. So most companies start out either ignoring or fearing open source. Then they start seeing it as, uh, you know, we need to consume open source to develop products because we can't keep up with the rest of the world like um, unless we do that. And that's kind of open source as this kind of free resource. And that's uh, fantastic, but only gets you so it only gets so much of the value out of open source to be able to build off of that free resource. And then you start releasing some open source projects, um, maybe without uh, with, without a lot of st strategy behind it. And maybe, you know, it's kind of luck whether or not you make a big impact there. Then the consumption starts to catch up with you. Open source is often viewed as uh, free as in a puppy, 
which means that the bugs, particular security issues in open source that you are building products around have to be fixed and you're now responsible for them and you're responsible for um, figuring out how to how to integrate the, the fixes that the community, other stakeholders in a particular open source project or all of the thousands of open source projects that you're relying on, how to get those back into your product. And at that point, you're contributing. So release, just releasing your own projects and contributing is actually uh, different or maybe the same operationally in some ways, but, but you know, strategically quite different. And particularly contributing upstream is something that kind of every product company has learned over time as they consume open source to get the benefits from that, but then want to work with the community to be able to get those security, uh, those security fixes and other innovations that, that the rest of the community globally, globally is doing. So in upstream, there's kind of a, a term of art to mean that um, kind of where the center of development for a particular project is, is happening. You want to contribute those upstream. And then finally, you, uh, you know, there's innovation happening all along the way, but a really sophisticated organization is going to see open source as part of their kind of innovation flywheel and be investing in it very strategically. And when you're there, you can create breakthrough things like TensorFlow that I'm excited to hear about hear about later. And even in a even in a company that isn't a software company, it's part of the the kind of digital transformation journey. Now the, these I want to argue that these all have analogies at the nation state level. The organizational level stuff happens within individual government agencies and and things like that, but I think we can scale those to a nation state level. And of course policy and, and think about what policies apply. And so, you know, at the at the nation state level, open source in the beginning is not even feared. It's simply it completely ignored. The next step is 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 often how can we consume open source to reduce lock in and save money? And that can come through procurement. Mike? And I'm yes. sorry. I'm sorry. You know, like let's uh, let's maybe speed, speed it up, up a bit. Yeah. Yes. Great. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. And then the next stage is launching experiments. And then I think where it really gets interesting at the at the national level is where it's seen as an imperative to foster an open source community. And that can be done, done through policy. And then finally, the equivalent, I think, of innovation and digital transformation is really investing strategically in open source uh, with one of the main goals being achieving digital sovereignty. So let's go on to the next slide. And through, so through that kind of uh, investment from companies and, and the nation state, I think we can fix some of the problems of that the open source commons has around potential underinvestment because we're all working together as a global team sport, both companies and governments to secure the digital ecosystem. And through that security, we can each kind of have the autonomy and grow the capabilities that we that we desire. And I think that's really uh, imperative for the world to do that. And I want to symbolize that by the the connected globe. We can we can have our castles. And by the way, that's a castle in 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 Poland since I can't be there close to the Czech border, as well as the connectivity that we that we need as well. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. Very, very interesting. I already have some some questions, and of course, uh, the castle is much appreciated. Um, so now uh, let's let's go to our second speaker, uh, Jeremy. Please. Okay. <clears throat> Good. This is Jeremy uh, from the China COPU, China Open Source Software Promotion Union. China uh, Software Promotion Union COPU, created in the year of uh, two thousand four. Uh, which is a social alliance voluntarily formed by IT vendors, customers, universities, communities, and research organizations. COPO think tank, uh, we have uh, more than 40 global open source executives and expertise representing technology, talent, and thought leadership. Now, uh, let's 
take a quick look on the China open source history. Normally, we define the open source history, China, uh, four stages. Stage one, from 1991, the milestone from AT&T introduced and opened the Unix System 5 release for source code to China. So you see this is really, we start from a global collaboration. Then second phase, starting 1999. So this phase, as just Mac mentioned, is mainly to consume, right? So people are learning and developing. Phase three, starting from 2009. So that's start the release and the contribution. Now we are in the phase four, collaboration. Let's see the uh, developers. So based on GitHub this year, latest report, China registered developers in GitHub 7.6 million, 10% global share, representing 16% year-to-year growth. Registered developer in China CSDN, China Software Development Network, 32 million, registered in Giti, that's open source hosting platform, six million. So green developers are the driving force for the open source collaboration and development. China also has very large market to adopt open source technologies and services. Companies now across industries are embracing open source. So, we have uh, very hard three areas, operating system, database, and AI. On top of three areas, we also see chip design, blockchain, IoT, industry internet, cloud native computing are also growing. So on those success, we also have seen big challenges. We have a technical risk. We have a legal, open source software license risk. We have a supply chain risk because if you take a look on the whole project life cycle, there are so many things inside. Any item broken will have some negative influence to the whole project. One more challenge is digital sovereignty. From a COPO point of view, we have found that open source has become a global collaboration and innovation model. Let me show you one example. Baidu Apollo, which is an open source autonomous driving platform. The latest version is 6.0, which released 600 k lines of code, gathering 45K developers from 97 countries with more than 200 partners. You see, this is really building an autonomous driving ecosystem and supply chain. Similarly, open source operating systems such as Open Harmony, Open Ola, Open Anoli OS are doing the same thing to promote the ecosystem. So 
we can conclude that open source can improve the trust among digital sovereignty partners and build skills and companies to support the digital economy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Very, very interesting. We actually took a look at China uh, in our study on the impact of open source right. for the commission. Uh, and it was very interesting because the approach is quite different than the European approach. It's, uh, it's a bit more industry heavy, I would say. So uh, yeah, I think we can talk about it uh, a bit more later. And now let's go to the next speaker, uh, which is Abhishek Singh. I hope that uh, I pronounce your name right. If not, please correct me. Thank you, thank you. You pronounced it perfectly. In fact, it was very right. And uh, thanks a lot for convening this. And it's indeed a pleasure to speak to, to listen to my previous speakers, uh, Mike and Jeremy. And it was interesting to see how the story of FOSS and the kind of innovation it is driving cuts across uh, regions and countries. But India's experience, story of digital governance and the adoption of digital technologies in the way we offer services to our citizens, the story of digital governance is almost synonymous with the story of FOSS. We have been like quite an early adopters of uh, free and open source software. And what we have experienced is that the kind of uh, benefits that comes from using FOSS is much more than the, or what it comes from using any kind of proprietary software. We have become like a uh, few things apart from what is the usual, this uh, panel has got all the experts, I would not go into the usual uh, benefits that one gets from FOSS, but what we have seen is that uh, it drives a culture of innovation. Okay, like whenever we expose a code and we allow in developers to put to, uh, to push and pull commits and then we try to improve uh, the way we are solving a problem in the tech space, we get a lot of ideas from innovators across and that leads to ultimately building a product or building a solution which is much more better, much more robust, much more comprehensive than what was maybe originally also thought. So this, uh, this culture of collaboration, this culture of openness, this culture, uh, innovation is what uh, makes the services better and more adaptive to the citizens. When we look at the, um, the statistics, we find that the state of FOSS reports uh, mentions that more than 85% like more of internet users in India, they use FOSS. And then we have a huge presence with regard to free and open source developer community, like uh, the team from GitHub is here and maybe they would agree that most of the GitHub, uh, the number of uh, uh, software developers of Indian origin who are contributing to the code generation on platforms like GitHub is immense and they are like, not only contributing to the global uh, public good, but also picking up things from there and ensuring that the best practices are also incorporated in our projects. The, we have implemented some of the very large uh, digital transformation projects and almost all of them run on free and on the free and open source uh, software. Like uh, I can take the names of the examples of the Aadhaar project, a unique identification project of India, which has got more than 1.3 billion people registered on it. It runs on a FOSS uh, uh, architecture. Then if you look at the e-education, digital education, the Diksha platform, which is, one which is built on the Sunbird open source uh, platform, which uh, it uh, ensured that during the pandemic, when uh, there was lockdowns and the schools were shut, the education did not uh, stop. And most, most students across the country were able to access lessons through the Diksha platform. The DigiLocker platform, which is a document wallet, which allows seamless exchange of data and information amongst various you know, government systems and allows citizens to also access them and share information from one system to the other. That is also built on a FOSS platform. Then the Arugya Setu, the COVID vaccination platform, the COVID platform, which is again the vaccination platform with which we have got done more than 1.28 billion vaccinations so far, you know, vaccine doses that also follows an open source uh, platform and then entire vaccination certificate that is given that's uh, again that's been uh, built on a uh, open source uh, divox uh, platform and we have offered india has offered this platform in the spirit of free and open source for any country anyone to adopt and do that and the idea behind it, that is that once we open up the code we do get inputs which further helps us improve that so that has been like the the philosophy of it on the policy front there has been a policy on adoption of free and open source software. We have been encouraging uh, more and more adoption of FOSS 
by running innovation challenges in various sectors we have worked with with the startups and we have worked with entrepreneurs to develop more robust for solutions and one thing one challenge that we have been found is that uh, the kind of myths and the kind of uh, kind of uh, miscommunication that uh, happens sometimes because when we did a survey with regard to what might be the bottlenecks to uh, to a wider adoption of fos what we found was that many many federal governments used to think uh, f in fos as free as in literally free and they would think that if somebody is offering a product which is for which nobody is charging anything in the terms of monetary value then nobody is responsible and uh, how can i trust to use a system which is totally free and uh, open so so we do, we uh, we do a lot of advocacy in order to explain that free means free to share free to exchange free to contribute free to adopt it does not necessarily mean free of cost and does not necessarily mean that it is less secure in fact there have been studies which says which show that how fos systems can be uh, more secure if not as much as uh, as the proprietary systems so that becomes a bigger challenge for a wider adoption of fos but yes with our partners with our stakeholders we keep on working on addressing those challenges the whole issue with regard to digital sovereignty very often again emanates from false notions about uh, about what happens when you use fos when you use fos it doesn't mean that you lose your data and your information to anyone because data and information will be protected by your data security standards and by ensuring that how do you do your encryptions how do you provide access controls that will determine that having a fos putting the code open in no way will compromise the kind of systems we are building as far as uh, data is concerned so i do feel that that uh, this this uh, fear about uh, fos compromising on digital sovereignty is misplaced and in fact it leads to to it leads to more uh, uh, if i can use the phrase a uh, greater degree of sovereignty because once you are if you are contributing as a system you are contributing to a global public good and if a nation is contributing to that that nation's voice is held is heard in any other country or any other region that is adopting that software in a way it expands the sovereignty rather than limits the sovereignty in 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 some way uh, if i can uh, say that the the platforms like this like uh, we convene at igf which brings together fos uh, stakeholders and fos uh, practitioners from across the country or across the world is going to be very useful for for uh, exchange of ideas for exchange of information very often the societal problems that we are trying to solve with free and open source software whether it's in agriculture or healthcare is common across so what has been done in uh, vietnam might be relevant to what is being done in india and the same thing might be uh, applicable to what we can plan to do in kenya so i i uh, compliment igf and the organizers of this uh, panel today for bringing together all of us on this uh, panel and look forward to an engaging discussion so with this i would conclude my opening remarks and look forward to listening from the other panelists thank you thank you abhishek uh, i i'm very happy that you uh, mentioned you know the public good aspect of it because this was also a big a big result that we had and this is also very attractive for policymakers it seems and i guess you are an example of it and uh, i guess you know the the initiative of the un that is called the digital public goods alliance which uh, is quite an interesting project about yeah i mean just open source tools other being used around the world for governmental services or just can be used as such um but now let's uh, let's go to natalia who's here in katowice uh, so please yeah great thank you it's great to be here with all of you today um, so I'm really glad that Abhishek, Jeremy, and Mike all touched on the economic implications of open source, and that's exactly what I'll be focusing on here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a study that I've been working on with my co-authors at Harvard Business School, Frank Nagel and Shane Greenstein, basically trying to understand the relationship between open source software and entrepreneurship around the world. So here you see a graph um, that is showing basically this relationship between the founding of information technology ventures on the y-axis and commits to GitHub, which is uh, at this point you know, pretty much the biggest platform used for open source contributions on the, the x-axis. And as you can see here, um, you know, any basic economics class will tell you it's a positive relationship. And notably, it's a positive relationship not only for high-income countries, which are often the focus of many software or information technology-related studies, but also for middle and low-income countries. But 
you know, this positive relationship might be because open source stimulates entrepreneurship. It might be the reverse relationship. Entrepreneurship stimulates open source. Or it might be just the case that um, open source is correlated with, you know, high human capital in different countries, which I think actually Mike touched on te te technical capabilities. And high human capital ends up leading to founding of IT ventures. So my co-authors and I really try to parse apart this relationship and look at, you know, does open source actually simulate entrepreneurship around the world? And does entrepreneurship stimulate open source? And what are the channels that underlie this relationship? So next slide, please. Um, so to be able to parse apart, you know, what are the actual directions of this relationship? Uh, we use um, an econometric framework that combines both just, you know, kind of your basic ordinary least squares regression, I won't go too much into this, as well as um, 2SLS, which uses different instruments to try to account for, you know, um, other factors that might be kind of playing a role in this relationship, like human capital. Um, and Notably, one of the instruments we use is policies that governments around the world across time have stimulated um, to support open source. For example, um, preferring open source in procurement systems, which helps us be able to better identify this relationship. And we find that um, open source software um, does positively predict the formation of new ventures. And the reverse relationship holds, though, a bit more weakly. So um, IT venture stimulates um, more open source contributions. And to be a little bit more concrete, a 1% increase in commits on GitHub, which is about a 1% increase in um, lines of code, uh, leads to about five to 15 new IT ventures per year per country on average. And in the reverse direction, a 1% increase in GitHub commits, uh, and I apologize, in IT ventures leads to or is associated with over 50,000 commits on GitHub. And again, commits you can think about as lines of code. And notably, we find that this relationship in both directions um, is particularly strong for ventures that are mission-oriented and global-oriented, which we measure through a machine learning technique using the descriptions of um, ventures around the world, as well as um, among high-quality ventures. So what does this all mean? Um, so for policymakers, um, what we notably find in this study is that open source software could be um, an important lever to stimulate innovative entrepreneurship ecosystems around the world. And notably, um, policies that might promote or uh, support open source don't ne necessarily need to happen reoccurringly in order to have these benefits, in the sense that um, if one prom promotes open source or helps stimulate open source activity, that leads to or um, may lead to the founding of IT ventures, which then, though more weakly, leads to more open source software and you know the flywheel, as Mike mentioned, continues. And for private sector, uh, what we um, suggest with our study is that investors might actually use open source software as a way to detect um, high quality entrepreneurial activity around the world, particularly in geographies that might be underinvested in among venture capital and other investor communities. So um, I'm sure Peter might be able to send the link over in the chat for this study. We have our working paper out and uh, very exciting to hear uh, from your questions. Thank you, very, very interesting. And of course this virtual cycle is, uh, is something that is uh, extremely interesting for those who ask, uh, okay, but like how do you make money with open source? But yeah, I mean, like, of course, like your study goes much, uh, much further than this. Um, and now, last but not least, uh, let's, uh, let's hear Lawrence Moroni, who's going to talk a bit more about AI and, uh, and the work that is happening on this globally. All right, yes, thank you. And thanks so much for all the speakers so far. This has been really fascinating. Uh, so I'm Lawrence and uh, I work at Google Alphabet. And my mission is really to make AI easy and to widen access to AI to as many people as possible globally. But why? Why would we do this? Well, one of the reasons is that I believe the biggest opportunity in tech today comes from artificial intelligence. And I put some stats on the screen here about some research that came from PricewaterhouseCoopers, showing that by the year 2030, they expect a $15.7 trillion contribution to the global economy. But perhaps more importantly, a 26% boost for local economies and a for average and a 45% of these total economic gains will come from enhancements to existing products. So 
The opportunity is obvious, but what we want to do is to ensure that there's fair and equitable access to AI and to the skills of AI so that it's just not in the hands of a few people. Now, I started my AI journey at Google in 2017, and one of the things that really triggered this was a study by Tencent in China that showed that we're only, at that time, 300,000 AI engineers in the world. And the key to measure and to understanding this was in how they measured that. And the only way that they had at the time was to count the number of people who had their names written on a paper, some kind of academic paper. And the logical conclusion from that is that AI was, and still at the time, was a very heavily academic discipline. And as such, the skills and the way of measuring those skills was really on the hands of a few elite universities, top companies, and that kind of things. Next slide, please. So, but given that um, we've been talking a lot today about open source, and what I want to really talk about is open source was just the beginning of this journey. And given that we had open source TensorFlow, which is a framework for people to learn and to build uh, AI models, uh, machine learning models for all kinds of things from computer vision through natural language processing and whatnot. Uh, but we saw that there was an opportunity to be able to reach software developers with AI instead. Now, there's lots of surveys and there's lots of measurements out there about how many developers there are. I think Jeremy earlier mentioned there were 7.6 million in China, which is about 10% of the global population. But at the time, we took a pretty conservative estimate that there were about 30 million software developers in the world. And we launched a strategy that said if we can equip 10% of the world's software developers, we would then train 3 million developers. And that would increase the number of AI practitioners globally 10x and people all over the world could begin to see the effects of this. So this is really the strategy. So continue to invest in the open source framework so that everybody can have access. We wanted to, with, uh, we released TensorFlow 2.0 in 2018 with the goal of this to be a programmer friendly interface. Um, the, the first version would kind of skewed more towards researchers. The second version was to be programmer friendly with what's called high level APIs uh, to make it more Pythonic if you're a programmer, to make it much easier for you to be able to build stuff. In addition to this, um, one of the things that you probably hear if you're not familiar with AI and machine learning is that you need pretty good hardware, uh, things like GPUs, powerful machines to be able to train. Now, we realize these powerful machines aren't available to everybody. The price of things like GPUs, and particularly with uh, Bitcoin mining and all that driving up the price of GPUs, we realized that that was a barrier of entry for many people in many economies. So we released something called Colab, which is a browser-based development environment and, it has, and it's backed up by GPUs in the cloud, which we provide for free. So anybody can open up a browser, go to Colab, and start training a, an AI model using our hardware. And then in addition to this was we really wanted to make sure that educational material was available to anybody. And we started with youtube.com slash TensorFlow so that anybody with an internet connection could get training for free online. But then to go deeper with this was to work with massively online, um, massively open online courses, MOOCs, and to make sure that they, we had a free tier with them. So we've partnered with many of the biggest MOOCs around the world, from Coursera to edX to Udemy to Udacity to NetEase in China. And we created a baseline syllabus that these could use. I taught some personally on Coursera, but we created this baseline syllabus that anybody could use to be able to put out courses, to be able to, to teach the framework the way the people who created the framework believe it should be used. This also led to a university program, and we've been working with universities in the countless countries, where the idea is that when we spoke with universities and we're trying to encourage them to teach AI, the hardest thing that they had to face was to have time to be able to design a syllabus, to understand that it's the correct syllabus. So again, the syllabi, syllabi is it syllabi, or syllabuses that we designed for the MOOCs, we made them openly and freely available to universities so that universities could teach them. And the results that we've had you know, in universities from the richest countries to the poorest, the opportunities there to be able to teach to students everywhere. And then from this, uh, we moved into a certificate program. So now the next big problem that we heard, particularly from employers in smaller economies, was that they didn't know how to find AI skills amongst engineers. And they didn't know the right questions to ask to be able to test people. So we launched a certificate program where we've designed exams that people can take and we've provided stipends and grants to people in low income countries to be able to take these exams. And then once somebody has passed this exam, then that opens up employment for them. And we've had amazing results in countries like Vietnam and Turkey, where like the, the first person in Turkey, for example, to get the certificate program was a woman. And we've been able to open up access to women through the certificate program to help them find employment in engineering as well. 
And then, you know, finally, just to go into, we've been working with partner countries um, that, that in governments of various countries, I'll call out one in Indonesia, I'm going to show a slide for that in a moment, where the idea is that governments who want to launch cohorts of people who can learn AI to seed their startup ecosystems and to be able to do this freely based on open source software, based on open education platforms have been able to do that. And in Indonesia, we launched a program called Bankit, or we worked with the government on a program called Bankit, which trained a cohort of 3,000 uh, people to be engineers in AI, in mobile development, and in other things such as cloud. And then finally, it was really to make sure that responsible AI tools and practices are available. So we've come up with a set of principles for how AI should be used responsibly and built responsibly that we've opened up to anybody, as well as tools to be able to do things like monitor your data, manage your data, understand whether maybe biases inherent in your data that you can actually spot. So with all of these, our goal was really, we wanted to lower the barrier of entry so that anybody can invest in AI, anybody can build skills to create AI powered application site solutions, and then all economies can benefit. And that's hopefully our contribution to helping digital sovereignty. Really, the goal is to lower the bar of opportunity far more than it's ever been so that anybody can take part in the tectonic shift of industry and economy that I spoke about earlier. And next slide, please. And then this is just an example from Bankit in Indonesia, where the Minister of Education ended up doing a fireside chat with some of our students. And, you know, it ended up being immensely successful. We've done other things. And I could tell a hundred different stories, but I know we don't have a whole lot of time. And, you know, about some of the things that are being done by students, by unemployed people, but, you know, um, to help in their local economies and to help in the particularly environmental stuff. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. It's super interesting. And of course, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that you mentioned the, f the fact that uh, the first person that finished the course in Turkey was a woman, because, I mean, this is a big challenge in open source that, you know, we believe in this whole meritocracy thing that, I mean, very often actually makes it a bit, a bit less equal. So actually, there is less w female developers among open source developers than in general in IT and among IT developers. Um, so it's great to have programs that are actually, you know, promoting the equitable access. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for the for the remarks to to all the speakers. This was uh, really interesting. I don't know if we have any questions in the chat, uh, but Peter is taking a look at it. Um, but maybe let's uh, let's start with a bit of a of a policy discussion. Um, so you know, we've heard from you know representatives from the private sector, from the public sector. And it seems that everybody is very interested in how open source can contribute to digital sovereignty and they see it as such. But maybe a, a question to Mike. Um, so like, how does it work when governments start to translate this idea of digital sovereignty into public policies? What are the implications and, and what have you seen? Because on the European level, I, I do have to say that there is a lot of concerns that uh, we are slightly becoming a, a fortress Europe. Um, and it, of course, depends on the sort of national political culture and how, you know, given government works and, you know, what goals they have generally, which, of course, I mean, the digital solutions are acting to, to achieve those goals. Um, so, yeah, Mike, any, any thoughts on this? Well, I think the um, engagement with open source is sort of... Uh, mitigates against the tendency to towards you know, Fortress Europe or Fortress, whatever jurisdiction you're talking about. And I mean, you can even see that in discussions amongst the, the open source community, you know, some who want to translate the, uh, you know, let's only invest in open source startups and projects that happen to be located in the jurisdiction question. And then often there's pushback saying, well, you know, we're going to benefit from the most from open source if we're consuming and contributing to open source as part of the global community. So I think um, sort of open source adds that uh, thought to get back to engaging with the global ecosystem that otherwise might not um, exist. But in, in terms of the I think very broadly, you know, government engagement with open source towards digital sovereignty is simply going to make open source much bigger and more diverse in a way. It's another kind of tectonic shift, um, kind of like corporate engagement with open source, which has grown incredibly over the last 10 years, especially 
and you know has also you know generated uh, controversy, cultural and political change, but overall has made open source much much bigger, more robust, and diverse. And I think public sector engagement is just going to do that kind of on another on another order, and that will be the that will be the biggest impact for the open source community long term. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it also goes to the uh, the thing that you mentioned in your in your remarks that you know we are strategizing and institutionalizing the involvement in open source. So like then it can be more sustainable, and you know also then governments can have a bit more control over it, and then actually it can deliver on these more digital sovereignty goals. But uh, Abhishek, Jeremy, any any thoughts on this? As you know, you either work for governments or very closely. <coughs> like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I see, I see Jeremy, so uh, yeah, please go first. Yeah, okay. If we look from the um, government sector, first, they are the users, right? As a user, they will care. The open architecture, open standards, right? And the open systems. So many things. They will care. They are technology. They don't want to lock in a single vendor, right? So all those, they will put together open stand, open architecture, open standards, open system. So open source is not just the software. They cover many things, right? On the other side, Government will care. What's the uh, in the future? How to influence the country economy, right? So all those from our COPU engagement of open source, the whole history, we have found that open source has become global collaboration innovation model. So we need to leverage those models, right? To power our economy, to power our digital economy. If we look open source, the nature, open, share, collaboration. So all those are help government to influence. In China, very clearly, uh, we have the uh, each five year we have uh, the the plan. So this year we have the uh, five year plan. It's very clearly asking for enterprise customers, for enterprise those enterprise the users. They need leverage open source. They need to participate in open source activities. They need to contribute to open source. On the other hand, they also need to learn what's the open source license requirements. They need to comply with legal rights. So this is a today, right? We have uh, those challenges. We have uh, opportunities. Then we need to work together with global communities, with global those developers, right? Mm -hmm. To resolve today, we have those challenges we listed, including digital sovereignty to address those, you know, local uh, restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. Local you know data security concerns to build the, the trust among all the digital sovereignty partners. This is going through the, our global collaboration. We can resolve that. Okay. Thank you. Very, very interesting, especially with the uh, five-year plan and that, you know, 
the, the entrepreneurial sector is encouraged to contribute and use open source because uh, this uh, quite clearly shows the difference in, uh, you know, of course, there are plenty of differences in policy making in China and in Europe or wherever else, but um, yeah. that it focuses on enterprise. It's, uh, it's very interesting. But also, actually, what, uh, uh, what, uh, what I noticed is that you mentioned that uh, the government is the open source user. And in my view, it very often moves on. I mean, the governments tend to start to be not only users, but contributors and maintainers. And, you know, we see it a lot in the European Commission, for example. I mean, they do have open source developers in, you know, in their units and like within the organization. Um, but yeah, it would be very interesting to hear, uh, Abhishek, yes. uh, what you think about the government as a user or as a contributor. As I mentioned in my initial remarks also, like uh, there's a great value for the government uh, to be both as a user as well as a, to be a contributor to the FOSS uh, ecosystem. Uh, and this we are saying from uh, first-hand experience, having implemented several uh, FOSS projects, which are uh, large impact, uh, high volume and impacting a huge uh, population. And uh, to the extent that uh, what we found was that at the policy level, there is hardly any challenge at the policy level. We have a government affairs policy which says that uh, FOSS will be the preferred way of implementing any e-governance solution. We also have the willpower, like whenever we interact with our federal governments, because India is a large country and we have like almost 35 uh, state or the federal governments, as we call them, which actually implement large, uh, many citizen-centric uh, projects. When we interact with them, they're also like there is a large, there's a unanimity with regard to the value for ads, but the challenge has been the how and who is the bigger bigger issue. Okay, like, how do you go about doing that? How do you do fast procurements? How do you do? How do you kind of uh, build in SLAs? And how do you ensure that you are able to deliver services to citizens as promised? So for that, we have been like working in uh, working on creating toolkits and creating templates for allowing for uh, quicker and easier adoption of FOSS. In fact, we also have taken an initiative for creating a gov stack for FOSS. You know, what it does is that the, all the governance solutions which have been done, which have been already been implemented in some part of, in any part of the world or any part of India, we put it into a GovTech stack and say that, yes, this is the solution which is already available. This is the commits, this is the commits which are available at GitHub or we also have a GitHub equivalent in India that we call Open Forge, on which we put our all our available. This is the location on which the on which is available on GitHub or on OpenForge. And this is what you can use uh, and uh, adapt it. And then we work with the, we organize a lot of trainings and capacity building programs in order to bring people at par to be able to use it. So, 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 so with that adoption is growing up. And then what people have found was that, that products improve because proprietary software, they have, they do, they do add value, but then they have a limitation to it because they're not by natural collaborative. So they would, keep on preserving it in the form in which it is till the version 2.0 or version 4.0 comes in. So, so with that, once we are able to do that, it becomes an easier way to adopt and do and value is added. And I will fully agree with the paper that was presented, you know, which showed the economic value or how it contributes to GDP and how it contributes to startups coming in place. In India, we are seeing it happening in real time that a number of uh, solution providers who are working with this free, with the data which is being made available with these open APIs, having access to them and building innovative solutions is seen to be believed because the entrepreneurs and the startups have the capability to think beyond what we can imagine. So if I'm doing a proprietary procurement, I would normally define the scope of the project uh, in the RFP and float it. But then the imagination of the entrepreneur is limited to that. But when we do something on an open uh, on an open architecture within uh, with uh, and expose our APIs and allow people to build solutions on top of it, then it, it drives innovation in, in a great manner. This we are seeing in the health domain also the national digital health mission that we are implementing. What we have done is that the basic building blocks in the sandbox has been created with all the registries and all the all the mandatory statutory requirements of data with regard to hospital databases, the doctor database, these and the, and the standards for various health records have been laid down. But on top of it, uh, on the existing ecosystem, entrepreneurs and open source uh, uh, developers are building solutions on top of that. So we see greater innovation coming in. And when greater innovation, new products come in, new services come in, interlinking of services happens, which is uh, simply not possible in the traditional way of development of systems. So yes, it uh, greatly benefits 
sovereignty in the sense that it strengthens and it also allows you to ensure that your solutions go far and wide our vaccination platform or uid the, the, there are a lot of countries across the world who are wanting to adopt it so we should think of it as something which strengthens the innovation ecosystem which improves the delivery of services and which expands the sovereignty footprint of any nation when it adopts this kind of system Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is fascinating, and I think that uh, then we can uh, we can switch to Natalia because uh, I think that's a, that's a pretty natural um, you know next step because you know I mean you talk about all these benefits and you know that we need to support it that you know the governments have noticed you know how well it works and that we see this innovation cycle, but I'm actually wondering Natalia, do you have uh, any further policy recommendations, you know, to just use the opportunity that is there, you know, to broadening access, to providing new services, better services, you know, to connect globally more people and more developers? Yeah, absolutely. I'd start with, um, you know, just going beyond the relationship and the impact of open source and entrepreneurship that I discussed. Um, if we take it a step back and, um, you know, you, you've presented the fantastic report on the impact of open source in the European Commission, or in European Union, but even beyond that, um, there's been great academic studies out there that have looked at the benefits of open source to firm productivity, to um, reducing frictions in the labor market where developers can use open source platforms as a way to signal their skills as well as their interest to employers, and as a way for startups to actually signal interest in financing and be able to find venture capitalists through the platform. Um, so kind of with these benefits in mind, um, you know, there's basically a lot happening through the private sector channels already and kind of the need for policy um, might be there, but the benefits, you know, carry through even outside of the, the public sector. Now, in terms of public sector, governments around the world have implemented um, policies across years that, for example, preference open source through procurement or, um, you know, as uh, we heard today, especially from Abhishek, um, are users of open source themselves and therefore um, are uh, sustaining and maintaining projects to which developers from the country and from other parts of the world can contribute to. So really policy can happen both in a more kind of top-down approach, like preferences, as I mentioned, as well as through more bottoms-up approaches, uh, facilitating projects which um, attract and engage developers from the country and from other parts of the world. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, we actually, in our study, we did take a look at uh, the impact that policies have. So like, if you have a policy that encourages uh, the public sector officials, you know, when they do public procurement to actually procure open source or favor open source, uh, it very much depends on the political culture there. So like there is a great example that actually Frank Nagel, that of course you work with, uh, took a look at. So in Italy and in France, they introduced quite similar laws that were favoring open source and public proc procurement. But in France, the impact was immense. And actually, you know, we have hard numbers that are saying, you know, just like the public services have become more innovative and better for the citizens. We had more innovation and all of that. And in Italy, it didn't really work. And actually, the interesting thing is that a lot of it was coming from the strong regionalization. So it's very difficult to find and to decide who is responsible for this. Plus the people who are actually, you know, public officials that are procuring software for their offices, they often don't know how to do it. They don't have skills to choose the right service. They don't have skills to, you know, like be able to determine if this open source solution is better than the other one. So it, it's often very easy for them to just like choose a proprietary solution you know, have it like one time thing and then, you know, move on. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if you want to if you want to say, uh, respond to this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I would add that, you know, obviously policies, and this is broader than, than this panel, policies are only as effective as they're implemented. So yeah. certainly if there's not yeah. a strong um, proponent mm -hmm. enforcing them, they're, they're not going to have much of an economic impact. Um, I would add, though, another um, good example of um, governments um, supporting open source a little bit more from the bottoms up approach, not like the uh, procurement kind of direct policy, is actually coming from Singapore. Um, so Singapore GovTech there has um, various platforms that enable um, small businesses and startups to actually um, add applications on top of their kind of open source uh, stack. So 
um, you know, that's a way that basically, again, from a very um, uh, bottoms up, I guess is the best way to say it, bottoms up approach, you um, can encourage both local and global businesses to innovate on top of what the government is already providing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I believe we have a question from the audience uh, on site in Katowice, so please uh, can just go to the, the microphone there and ask the question. I believe it's, it's for Natalia, but if not, yeah, just uh, just tell me. And if you can just introduce no, it's yourself. for everybody, as you wish. Uh, okay. First of all, I appreciate you brought all those, all these bright panelists. Uh, you know, uh, AI projects across the, across the world, they are all somehow engaged with governments, whether they are founded by governments or they use data coming from the governments. And as you mentioned uh, clearly and some other panelists, the, the political cultures are different across the world. So some governments, they recommend, they even put a condition to have the result in open source platforms, but in reality, they don't like it, or they limit you on which platform, they give you a specific platform. Majority, there are local platforms. So if we consider data as the new oil in the world, we see all the history of oil ownership in this atmosphere as well, right? What about this idea that uh, replacing a global platform to share everything we think of like regional or even national open source platforms like a multiverse. Then we can expect a metaverse in the future. Some, uh, how in the future there would be a new platform to make a connection between all those regional or local platforms for open source innovation or uh, algorithms or even big data. Uh, I think it could be a, a solution a short-term solution to make us, to keep us together. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting thought and uh, an interesting question and goes a bit to the thing that I mentioned uh, before, you know, like there's these concerns of fortresses, you know, like the whole idea of digital sovereignty and building fortresses that is very difficult and frankly, and in my opinion, it's counterproductive in the digital world. It just doesn't work. Uh, but Lawrence, uh, any, any thoughts on this? As, yeah, I mean, like you coordinate so much on global AI cooperation. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear what sure. you think about it. Yeah, sure. I think, first of all, I'd say on your point of fortresses, I think one thing that tends to be forgotten is uh, brain drains and skills. Um, like, for example, I actually grew up in Western Europe, and I grew up in uh, two of Western Europe's uh, weaker economies during the 1980s and 1990s, and that was Ireland and Wales. And I'm a classic example of the brain drain, uh, because for me to be able to launch a career in computing, I had to move to the US. And countless other people like me had to move. And, you know, as a result, if you have a drain of skills leaving your country, it's hard for you to have any kind of a fortress or any kind of digital sovereignty. Now, with the upcoming AI revolution and the, the, the stats that I cited earlier on, one of the things that I believe is really, really important that's very, very different now that I believe governments should take advantage of is the fact that, and to answer the question from the gentleman a moment ago, is that you know there are global scale platforms for building AI services and AI uh, solutions, such as TensorFlow. We also have competitors such as PyTorch, which is also open source. But the key is that they are open source and open source means that they're globally available, means that they can be forked by somebody if they wanted to do so. I wouldn't suggest it, uh, but that the, uh, the framework is available for anybody to use. And um, uh, GitHub provide a beautiful platform that allows you to do an analysis. And we did an analysis of users of TensorFlow and or people who have starred TensorFlow. And we actually have people in almost every country in the world. We do have people in every time zone. And we actually have people from all the way in Trondheim, as far in northern Norway, all the way down to Deception Island in Antarctica using TensorFlow. So, you know, the openness of that means that it's possible for somebody to use that anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I believe, you know, the global type of platform for people to be able to use this kind of thing can only be empowered by open source. And hopefully that's something that will prevent a future brain drain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point, and uh, I fully agree that the brain drain is very often omitted and not, uh, not discussed. And like also in Europe, you know, like it happens, you know, from the east to the west and all. But uh, do you have any, um, any further thoughts on the policies that you would see as uh, beneficial, you know, on the national or regional level? 
that could actually foster this global co cooperation and you know just ensure that you know we can share these resources and we can work together so i mean um, from the policy on the national level here in the us one of the things that we have is that all data from the government because it's funded by taxpayers has to be open and all solutions built using that also have to be open and i think that's massively beneficial to everybody i would recommend that other countries follow that lead um, I'm not an expert on policy in any particular country, um, but I will cite one project that I had worked a little bit with, and that was in the UK. And in the UK, um, they have a national health service, and the national health service is funded by taxpayers to provide free or low-cost health care uh, for people who live there. And But one of the things was that in the UK, I'm trying to remember the exact statistics, but in 2020, I believe it was there were 2 million people in the UK aged 100 or greater. But by the year 2100, they believe there will be, I think it's 20 million people aged 100 or greater, and 98% of healthcare costs were in the last two years of their lives. So one of the things they wanted to do was provide great healthcare uh, for people, but also to keep the cost down for taxpayers. And, one of the, and of course, they needed to apply AI to be able to do this, which would require open access to the data uh, to be able to build solutions for this. But by government policy, open access to personal data like healthcare data may not always be available. And that's a problem that they're wrestling with. So I would say one of the things that I would encourage is that, you know, for governments is that to kind of weigh out that balance of um, understanding public benefit from access to data, while also exploring ways that data can be kept private, but still accessible to others to be able to build solutions with it. So there are technologies out there for like anonymizing things, for keeping it private, for obfuscating it so that it's not misused. But there's a lot of fear inherent in that, um, particularly if it's going to be used for in, in something like very personal data, like healthcare data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, actually, I found it interesting that you didn't go into the whole ethics uh, discussion on AI, because, you know, I feel that this is uh, the largest part of it, usually, you know, I mean, because in Europe, we also have this sort of tradition of open data and, and you know, and sharing. And actually, right now, there's quite some legislative proposals that are dealing with this to just ease the access to data that might be useful for companies, also AI companies. But we do focus on the on the ethics side. But uh, do we have a question in the audience? Yes. So. Yeah, please. Hi. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, maybe just, you know. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Lena Rampainen from Electronic Frontier Finland. And my, well, I also work in the kind of open source sector because my, the company I work for, Ivan, does open source based services. But basically, I just wanted to bring up a, a policy I know from Sweden is that they have the public sector procurement has done their an open source purchasing framework agreement which, as far as I know, has made it a lot easier for different public sector actors and municipalities and whatnot to actually purchase open source software and open source services because they don't all, all need to kind of reinvent the wheel and remake all those agreements. But there's one agreement and then all the different actors can just use it. Yeah, this is, uh, this is very interesting. We, we are quite in contact with, uh, with the Swedish and having these guidelines is... Uh, very crucial, I believe, and we see that, you know, I mean, of course, like such guidelines very often have to be updated and changed and like, you know, we have to upskill. So, I mean, we don't talk only about skills and education, like, uh, you know, Lawrence was talking about, for example, but we also talk about public officials. Um, but yeah, any uh, any thoughts on policies that can further, uh, further bring these goals uh, for governments from any of our speakers? Um, I don't know, uh, Mike or Jeremy, something that you would like to add on policies? Well, I, I, I mean, we've talked a fair bit about open data kind of naturally. Mm -hmm. I guess I would just add that open hardware is, a, and I know the study, the European Commission study also covered open hardware, but that's another critical ingredient of digital sovereignty that is, you know, has substantial overlap in terms of community and development methodology, et cetera, but also differences. And so those kind of three open things, open data, open hardware, and open software, which is the largest, are all like important policy or objects of policy, I think that governments need to be thinking of when formulating policies to make, um, you know, open contribute to digital sovereignty. Um, I, Another thing that we haven't 
discussed at all, but is we've mainly been talking about policies that could foster open source, which I think is great. That is the main focus. We also, another like policy implication of the importance of open source for digital sovereignty is that governments need to be increasingly will be aware of to, to think about fostering open source collaboration in other policies and in particularly not undermining open source collaboration. And this can, we, we saw this in the, in the EU over, you know, several years ago around the copyright directive. And unfortunately we were able to achieve a win there, but it, you know, touches areas from things like intellectual property that, that, that was that example to even things like internet availability so that developers can, uh, you know, participate in the, in the, uh, in the, global team support of open source. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very interesting. And also, I mean, uh, this is a concept that uh, we have been working on quite a bit, uh, you know, is the concept of uh, open source program offices that is very helpful in making sure that, you know, we are not only fostering, but actually collaborating and sort of using the capacity that is there in the, in the private sector. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience uh, on site. If there are, just you know, raise your hand and let us know. Uh, but we will continue the discussion. I think uh, we don't really have questions on the chat uh, at the moment. Um, so I would like to go to back to uh, go back to Natalia, and it's this interesting idea that you know we talk about digital sovereignty, but we see that actually the private sector is doing a lot of the work. Um, and what do you think is the right approach to make sure that, you know, it's sort of a balancing act and, you know, that like it works both for the benefit of the governments, of the citizens and for the benefit of the companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think Mike actually brought up a crucial point in his last comment about um, essentially governments um, helping to create the right enabling environment to foster um, both open source software, but then just kind of broader technical capabilities. Uh, part of that comes from building up the human capital and, and digital skills more broadly. And certainly we're seeing you know, governments around the world who um, are either um, facilitating STEM education in primary and secondary schooling or kind of um, more targeted AI blockchain um, technology development in universities. But the other side of it is, is again, uh, just giving access to internet. I think there have been various panels um, in this forum that have talked about you know, how much of the world actually doesn't even have access to basic internet. And of course, if you don't have internet, um, much less you know, outside of skills, you certainly can't really contribute to GitHub. So I really think um, government can play a very important role in facilitating the enabling environment. But at the end of the day, um, you know, in terms of uh, the economic benefits of, of things like jobs or um, productivity. I mean, that is really where firms in, in many countries um, are really, um, are in the driver's wheel. Um, and certainly, you know, that's happening with or without government policy. You know, we're, um, if, if we think back to the 1990s, um, it was a very different time. Mike had brought this up about um, companies uh, orientation towards open source, especially software companies. They saw it as, as competitive. And now, I mean, pretty much every company uses open source. It's just, and, and particularly um, platforms like GitHub, just because it's such a more efficient way of collaborating on code and um, iterating very quickly in the new, uh, more agile models of development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um yeah, I mean, you know, we, we did discuss it quite uh, quite a bit today. And yeah, I mean, like all of these sessions here, I mean, like, I, I really like the point about the access, you know, like, I mean, the whole, the meaningful access. And, you know, like, I think that this is a very important part of the, the whole open source discussion. Actually, and, and I, I'd add one point, I think going back to the digital skill side, one challenge of uh, open source platforms is, and this has actually been covered in, in um, a few studies in the past, but you know, increasingly, um, people who do contribute to open source are pretty seasoned developers. And, um, you know, as a result, they don't necessarily need to provide kind of very intense documentation to be able to do their work and for others to contribute as well. And certainly that is a challenge, right, for a newcomer to come into the platforms and be able to contribute. So, again, that's a place where it's, I think, um, could be both uh, in the hands of government as well as private sector to kind of help ease in newcomers to these platforms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's also, I mean, of course I'm going back to policies, but you know, as, as soon as you have a governmental policy about it, I mean, then people feel that working on open source is, you know, like, I mean, sort of like higher on the agenda. So of course, like they try to get this access and hopefully, you know, sort of the governance rules, which I mean, of course, the whole discussion on governance is, is a very separate one plus on motivations of the developers that are contributing. But, you know, like I like to go back to the point that the public sector is not only a user, I mean, it's, it's becoming to be an equal participant in the in the open source landscape, um, but yeah, um, I was uh, Abhishek. Any any thoughts on because you know we we talked we talked about the open data, we talked about open source, and I was wondering if you have thoughts if open source is like because you know. For me, I work on this a lot, and for me, this is special. And you know, in in the European Union, we do policies on open source that are standalone policies, but it's a part of like the whole digital landscape and the whole stack and the whole you know like supply chain of any digital product. Uh, so, do you see this sort of open source ideas going you know within the government to like other sectors or other digital policies, and you know, sort of like bringing together different digital policies? Yeah, exactly. So this is the way it's going because the value of open source is realized by almost everyone, as I had mentioned. It's not that people don't understand that. The only problem that has is how do you how do you ring fence yourself against questions like will it compromise your security? Will it compromise like who will who will assure continued support? So those are the issues that we need to crack while going ahead with open source because as a principle, whether it's on a on a collaboration, nature of collaboration and the way the world is evolving, the digital era, it's all about people working together through collaborative tools and all. And that principle is reflected well in the open source de development uh, philosophy. And that is well accepted. And the only challenge that we, which, which we need to address is that make it easier to procure, make it easier to adopt, make it easier to replicate, make it easier to share and uh, create systems which would ensure that continued support will be there because open source doesn't mean that you take something from somewhere out uh, in the sky and nobody is responsible. So if you have the support systems built in, then the governments will be willing to adopt it. Like what happens when, suppose there is a champion of open source, he comes, I will implement this project. If he goes, how does it continue to support? That institutional mechanism for supporting open source projects becomes very critical for its sustenance. And when we do that, all these questions get answered. And when it comes to our data and data security and uh, and data sovereignty, if I may use the word, then we need to delink the two that open source software development is a different piece and data security is a different piece. And data security and data uh, confidentiality become as important whether it is a proprietary software development or an open source development. That goes without saying. So building the essential uh, protocols for protecting the data that needs to be protected. And there also the principle that most governments are following, including India, is to go in for a default open data policy. That any data which doesn't have personal attributes, which doesn't have, which is anonymized at the aggregate level, let it be shared on an uh, on an open data portal. And then anyone who wants to use that anonymized data without any personal attributes can use it for building solutions. So healthcare data can have a lot of value at the aggregate level. One can. Uh, predict uh, one can build models for predicting uh, predicting uh, epidemics one can build models for uh, ai models for uh, predicting what may happen at what time how much uh, how much uh, medicines will be required how much oxygen will be required so this entire data modeling hap uh, happens there so data should be viewed separately or software development should be viewed separately and once we do that and when we enable the institutional framework adoption becomes very easy and we are able to answer the questions that many have so that's the way we are approaching open source adopt, adoption and replication across. And I'm sure similar models will be there in other countries. And uh, especially with the, with a forum like IGF, one, one can think of is like, can we create a, a, a global partnership for enabling open source adoption or a global partnership for building uh, GovTech uh, solutions based on open source. So there's, if there is any work which has been done for solving a societal problem in agriculture and healthcare, can the same IT solution, the same code, can the same software be shared with a larger uh, number of countries so that the humanity as a whole benefits? So that's what we need to move on, move ahead instead of debating whether it will lead to any risks or something. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I mean, what I mostly took away from it and uh, liked a lot is the continuous support and, you know, just making sure that the building blocks of the whole idea and philosophy are in place. So then it's easier to actually make it, you know, go forward. But uh, we are slowly approaching the, the end of our session. So I would like to ask each of our panelists to think about one question, one insight that you would like to, you know, just like share with the participants or you took away from this session. Because, you know, I mean, this is the whole idea of IGF that is, I mean, it's great, you know, to make us to make us think and wonder and try to find solutions. And of course, we might not necessarily find the solutions, but, you know, we can we can think about it. So I'm going to uh, to start with Mike, who has started with his introductory remarks. Okay. Well, I think the uh, my you know the thing that I think is most heartening is that all, everybody in this session at least alluded to the win-win nature or of open source or as Abhishek just mentioned, kind of building solutions that can benefit all of humanity. And I think that's really the something we should always keep in mind when we're thinking about open source and digital sovereignty that. Open source can enable a version of digital sovereignty in which literally everybody in the world, all governments in the world are sort of winners from this. They all get more sovereignty, more autonomy, more capability by engaging with open source, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to being a version of digital sovereignty, which again is, you know, involves fortresses and and um, over competition, maybe. And, and that's that's really kind of a frame that I want everybody to think about when they're thinking about open source and digital sovereignty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jeremy? Okay. <clears throat> and please keep it under one we, minute. Uh, <laughs> right, if we see the open source, that's, uh, you know, that's the, um, the uh, global collaboration, right? From uh, software developers, from communities, right? Very good, it, the thing is uh, the collaboration build up the trust. So when we have a global issues, global concerns, if we have trust, we can resolve everything. Without trust, we cannot do anything. So if we leverage the collaboration, we can resolve our issues and concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very, very interesting thought. I mean, yeah. Uh, Abhishek? Yep. Yeah, I mean, one insight for the audience that you would like, you know, people to wonder about or just remember from this session. Uh, I would just, uh, the takeaway from me is that, yes, uh, open source is here to stay. It leads to innovation. It leads to economic growth and uh, boost to entrepreneurship. So what we need to do is to collaborate with the stakeholders in order to carry forward the open source agenda. Thank you. Straight to the point. Uh, Natalia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that um, open source is more than just an intellectual property regime. It really is a mindset and a community. And I would say I actually, big motivation for the study that I discussed came from sp speaking to developers here in Poland um, a few years ago who you just, you feel that energy in that community right away. And the reality is, is that building up this community requires an enabling environment where there's a role both for private sector, companies like Google, as we learned about today, to facilitate certifications and other types of digital skills, and for government to enable inter internet access and to support that types of um, human capital development. So really, um, open source is great, can lead to a lot of economic and, and broader benefits, but you need to create the environment to facilitate it. Thank you. And again, last but not least, Lawrence. Do we still have Lawrence with us? Okay, I guess uh, he might be. He might be thinking that uh, we almost finished uh, because we almost did. Uh, thank you so much for all these insights. Um, I mean, I found it very interesting and I know that it's not that easy to discuss the whole idea of digital sovereignty because, again, everybody perceives it differently and not that many perceive the way of openness as the way to go. 
Uh, so, I mean, you know, of course, this is the panelists that we gathered in this circle, and this is, you know, what we all, you know, sort of look forward to, but not everybody does. So uh, what I hope is, you know, the, the, you know, something that you're going to take away from this session is that, you know, we don't have to think of the ideas and the frameworks that come from the policy as, you know, just as they are being defined at the very beginning. But, you know, they can be taken somewhere else by the global community, by the developers, by the citizens, by the users who usually just want to have a bit more independence and just want to use services that are a bit better. Um, so I hope that uh, you enjoyed the session. And um, yeah, I'm sure that there's plenty of uh, nice discussions afterwards. So yeah, see you at IGF. And you can always contact us uh, whenever you want. I'm Paula from Open Forum Europe. Thank you so much and have a good day.